Hi, I'm Dr. Walter Cranion. I'm co-chair of the Environmental Health Symposium. In 2019, our theme is endocrine disruption, which is far more than just reproductive hormones. It affects many of the chronic diseases that all of us are facing. Our keynote speaker is Pete Myers, uh, Dr. Pete Myers, who has we would not have endocrine disruption as something we know without Pete's work. Pete was there at the very beginning. Pete, you are co-author with uh, Theo Coburn for the book that started this whole movement, Our Stolen Future. You were at the very beginning. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. I should make sure to mention Diane Dumanowski, who was the third author and a really wonderful reporter whom we recruited to actually do the drafting of much of the book. Um, she, Diane was a critical contributor to that, that whole process. But Diane and Theo and I um, had a great deal of fun actually working with each other uh, for about two years as we were writing the book. But yes, I was there at the beginning. The big, uh, at least as we know it as a field of endocrine disruption, um, that term was introduced at a conference that I co-organized with Theo in 1991 at the Spring. Right. Spring. right. And then it was there. Winspread conference. Excuse me? It's the, it's the famous Wingspread conference that you guys didn't let anybody go until you got a consensus statement on this, which is what opened up the whole field to government funding, et cetera. It did play an important role. Um, it, it has an interesting, there's interesting background to it also. Um, I had written a chapter in a book in 1989. Um, on climate disruption, um, which I decided to call climate disruption because it was clear that um, there are many more things going on than just global warming. Um, and I went into the 1991 meeting at Wingspread uh, with that thought in mind. And particularly, um, I was intrigued by the format that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1990 used for its executive summary, where they, they came up with a, an approach that involved a descending uh, series of statements uh, with the in opening one being, what are we certain about? And following that, then in a series of other statements uh, of descending certainty, it was really interesting to me because you will wind up at the bottom with the scientists naming the areas of research they want to conduct where there are clear gaps and there's not understanding. Um, but it's structured in that way because the policymakers will read the first two paragraphs. And that's all about what we're certain about. The final section keeps the scientists happy because they can disagree, scientists are trained to disagree, and policymakers are always surprised when scientists agree, especially with certainty. And so I brought that structure to the Wingspread Conference and suggested that we follow it, which we did. And I, I believe that um, it, that approach uh, was very important to establishing the area, th this area of work. I should say, that John McLaughlin in the 1970s actually held two conferences on estrogens in the environment. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there were precedents to this work, but no one approached it as broadly as Theo did. Um, and so in that sense, the field really got its, its uh, biggest first salvo as a result of that meeting. Yeah, that was incredibly impactful again as i said because it it opened up government funding for research and researchers yep. uh, when i where, where's the funding i'll study it yeah there, there's another part to that story too um john porter uh, a republican member of com congress from northern illinois um became a friend um his wife, Catherine Porter, was actually working with me when I was at the Jones Foundation. 
And I had many discussions with John about endocrine disruption uh, as we were working on the book. When the book's published in 1996, he invites me to a hearing. He happened to be the chair of the House Appropriations Committee on Health. Um, a very key position for obtaining funding. And he invited me the day that he had Harold Barmas testify, who at the time was the head of NIH. And he held up our stolen future and said, Dr. Varmus, you need to read this book. <laughs> um, now, John was very careful about not intruding uh, in the details of where money flowed. His job was to get make, make sure that the medical research establishment had the money it needed to do the collection of work that it does. But it was very, he, he, so he didn't say fund endocrine disruption, but he did encourage people to learn about it. And that played a, a vital role also in leading to what had, has been now hundreds of millions of dollars going into research on EDCs, endocrine disrupting compounds. That is so amazing. Um, the book was a bestseller in Japan. Um, so I spent uh, a lot of time in Japan in the 19, 1997, 98. I actually took a copy of uh, Our Still in Future to the um, first big Kyoto conference on climate change. It had just come out uh, in 97. And so I was carrying this book around trying to interest Japanese reporters in it when they were really focused on climate. In any event, um, my favorite story from that period was um, when Princess Nori, the daughter of the Emperor of Japan, on the occasion of her 30th birthday, published a statement saying, I am very worried about environmental hormones, which was how they translated endocrine disruption. So I saw that and I was about to go to Tokyo for a debate with the industry, um, sponsored by the New York Times of Tokyo, the, the Asahi Shinbun. So I wrote my host and said, gosh, the princess is interested in this. Maybe she would like to meet me. And I got a reply almost immediately saying, no. But then two weeks later, I got another email saying, be in the front of the hotel at 10 a.m. A limo will pick you up and take you to the palace. And so I got to spend an hour and a half with Princess Nori, along with Tai Iguchi, one of my Japanese colleagues. Uh, and her copy of the book was filled with little plastic stubs marking pages that she had found of value. Um, probably, I'd say at least 50, if not 100 plastic markers. And then after that session, I had tea with the emperor and the empress. Um, not the normal thing for a guy from Baltimore to do. Um, we um, sat in their private quarters. It was the private part of the, the uh, imperial palace. They brought in tea and cookies and cakes and stuff. And at one point, I noticed early on, I noticed, well, wait a second, there are three cherries, Bing cherries on the, on the plate and they still have pits. What do you do with the, what do you do with the pit in front of the Empress of Japan? So I waited until I saw what she did. Smart man. And I, had, I hadn't noticed that there was a, a napkin, silk napkin rolled up on the tray and one end was twisted. And so, when it came time to eat the cherry, she picked it up, put it in her mouth, and then spit the uh, pit into the open end of the silk napkin. So I did it. Anyway, it was a delightful discussion. They clearly spoke and understood English, but they had a translator with them um, the whole time. Uh, they asked very in question, intelligent questions. The, the royal family is prohibited uh, by the Constitution from becoming engaged in politics. So both he and his father, um, actually no, he and his family, um, the emperor, uh, were biologists, which gave us something else in common to talk about. His it, daughter actually studied King Francis. It is so fantastic that you're going to be at EHS 2019 because you were at 
the start of it, and you're still involved in endocrine disruption to this day. And as a matter of fact, you just published an article in September of this year that was very unique and I think impactful on blood sugar and BPA. Can you tell us about this amazing article that you did? Sure. Uh, it was the first um, randomized study delivering BPA directly to people um, and examining uh, effects that would make sense to physicians. Um, it, it, I am not a diabetes expert, okay, um, nor an insulin regulation expert. I, I came into this, I, I thought this experiment up because I was extraordinarily, extraordinarily frustrated by how the FDA was dismissing literally thousands of animal experiments showing impacts of BPA at low doses. Um, and also now many epidemiological studies showing, us, showing us associations between BPA and variation in diabetes risk. Um, and my colleague at the University of Missouri, Fred Vomsall, had just published uh, in the last few years a paper where in, in which a study in which um, he had people handle thermal receipt paper. Right. Um, and then looked at absorption, dermal absorption of BPA uh, as a result of handling it. And she, he had worked closely with the Institutional Review Board, the IRB at the University of Missouri, to get permission to do that experiment. Um, and so what we d decided was to see if it would be possible to get permission to do a randomized control experiment, a randomized um, exposure experiment with people, which is highly unusual for uh, doing so with a toxic agent. Yeah, that's um, something that really amazed me when I read it is that, wow, an IRB did approve this. This is bold. Of course, we couldn't have done it without that without that approval. And, and here's the reason why they did. Um, we're exposed to low levels of BPA every day throughout our lives. Uh, a lot of that exposure comes from thermal receipt paper, but also from the like, linings of cans and other ways that BPA um, is present in our environment. Um, and so we knew that we could reduce people's BPA exposure by counseling them and various measures that they could take for a couple of days prior to the experiment. So they came into the experiment with low amounts of BPA exposure. We exposed them to something they would normally encounter in their lives, mm -hmm. to a level they would normally encounter, mm -hmm. uh, and which in this case was the reference dose, the, the level that the FDA considers to be safe. And so we wound up with people over that three-day period uh, actually collectively uh, being exposed to less BPA than they would have normally because we reduced them for two days. And then we exposed them for one day, actually one time. And um, we also made sure there were no uh, pregnancies involved. Um, the, a small number of women were, but they were all postmenopausal. Um, and we, we recruited people who were healthy um, and not, and and also obviously non not pregnant, and that met IRB's um, criteria for something we could do. And the reason why I did it was, or we did it, because I could not have done it myself. Um, and the we, um, we being um, Angel Nadal, who's a diabetes expert from uh, Spain. Rick Stahlhut, who actually did most of the, the experimental work that was involved. Uh, Fred Vomsall, uh, Julia Taylor, and also a diabetes specialist from University of Missouri. Um, we wanted to test the hypothesis directly that uh, low level exposures to BPA cause physiologically meaningful re uh, effects. And you found that- That's what we did. The A1C, did you not? Yes, um, we found several 
uh, interesting results. Um, the most important of which was that the first phase of, of insulin release was increased, you know, and the second phase was decreased. Um, and Angel, who's the diabetes deep expert on the team, said this this is concerning because that second phase is how it is what happens when insulin is being metabolized. The first phase is use is using already stored uh, insulin. This excuse, yeah, and the second phase is is um, metabolizing is creating new insulin and if the patient is unable to um, take that second step um, they're at increased risk to diabetes at least that was his interpretation of it now I, the, I should, full disclosure it was a tiny study eight right. eight subjects right but highly significant results highly um, significant. in part those re significant results were enabled because we used each case each subject as his or her own control. control so we did them with and without exposure were in a randomized way. Um, and, and we got the results and we would have, we were determined to publish it, whether or not the results were supportive of the hypothesis or uh, refuted the hypothesis. Um, and they are supportive, but the sample size is low enough that clearly it has to be replicated. And we were trying to, raise the issue to a level of interest at the NIH that they would put serious money into doing this uh, at full scale. I don't know if that's going to happen yet. That is such an amazing groundbreaking uh, study that you did. So you've been Thank you. part of endocrine disruption since the beginning, but you're still doing research on it. So we're really, really privileged to have you come to EHS 2019 and you're going to be our keynote speaker. And it's, I look forward to it. I'm very, I, I feel very privileged to have you come here, Dr. Myers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Waller.